everybody. I'm about to hop on a Zoom call with Dr. Chris Rohner and Dr. Simon Pierce from the Marine Megafauna Foundation, and I thought it'd be fun to bring you along. As you may know, we donate 10% of profits from all of our advocate apparel to various researchers and educators around the world that are doing high impact work. Our whale shark products include leggings, board shorts, headbands, sun masks, and most recently, scrunchies. And no, I do not wear that in public. If you've bought any of these products over the last few years, we've been donating 10% of profits from them to the Marine Megafauna Foundation. We thought it would be cool to bring you along into this conversation to learn about what they do, how they spend the money. So let's give them a call. Everybody, super excited to be here. I have Dr. Simon Pierce and Dr. Chris Rohner of the Marine Megafauna Foundation on the line. And, and you guys are on like the other side of the planet. Where are you guys right now? Yeah, I'm in New Zealand. I'm in Australia. So yeah, that's quite, we're in Miami. So we're literally like on the opposite sides of the planet. Um, so my first question to you guys is sort of what I ask everybody is, tell us about your organization. What is the Marine Mega Foundation? How did it start? And, and what is, can you tell people about kind of the work that you guys do? For sure. We talk about our marine megafauna. So there we're talking about some of the really large marine species that are, that are also really threatened. Our work kind of developed from a project in Mozambique a few years ago, uh, where we were studying manta rays and whale sharks is obviously two large threatened species. And then we kind of really saw the potential there uh, for using these big species as kind of conservation icons and sort of flagship species for ecosystem level protection and also uh, to help some of their like equally threatened but less well-known sort of relatives as well. Uh, so we've ended up working internationally over the past few years, mostly on sharks and rays and the, the whale sharks and manta rays are still kind of probably the, the flagship research programs, uh, but also got a lot into on the ground conservation efforts in, in multiple countries and also education as a way of making sure we kind of cement those gains too. And Chris, could you maybe tell us a little bit about sort of the structure of the organization? Is it an institute? Is it a nonprofit? How does it kind of work in that regard? Yeah, so it's a um, non-governmental organization, an NGO. Um, it's still pretty small. There's a few of us scientists and there's a, a conservation team and an education team. There's quite a, a lot of the people involved are volunteers and they volunteer their time to help out because they believe in the course as a relatively small organization operating in developing nations. Um, so we're looking for grants usually to do our projects and a lot of our funding is you know, piece together from various places where we can get a little bit of uh, support, including from you guys from Model Last. Obviously, it's been really an important partner for us over the years. So that's how we work. Uh, so far, it's been going all right. This year, obviously, is a bit of a challenge, but that's the same for everybody. And I'm sure we get to, we get through it. Uh, my second question has to do sort of with kind of, I guess, your personal thoughts about why is it that you think people love whale sharks so much. And we, we see that with our customers. A lot of people that have never even seen the ocean love whale sharks. They have this really strong affinity for whale sharks. And I'm curious, sort of a question to both of you, why do you think um, that is? And, and what's the backstory personally for you getting drawn in as a marine scientist into that species? Yeah, so I mean, the reason why a lot of people are excited about whale sharks is probably because they are really large and there's not a lot of really large animals where you can get really close to like you can with a whale shark they're obviously not dangerous to people so you, so you can swim with them easily um without any harm to you and you are just literally swimming with the biggest fish in the ocean it's a pretty cool experience uh, and, and even if you haven't swam with it it's even just the thought of it is pretty cool probably the only the only other thing you can kind of compare it to might be a, a big humpback whale or something like that that you can also uh, interact with on the water. Um, that's probably the, the main reason why people like whale sharks. They're friendly and they're big and they look cute. Yeah, what do you reckon, Simon? I, I mean, swimming with them is just such an amazing experience. I was just blown away, like the first time I was able to able to do it. And, and you see, it's so fun going out on the boat with people that it is their first experience, or sometimes it's it's after a long time and it's still just like, it's it's kind of a life-changing thing. And obviously it's changed our lives. Um, and we're really lucky that with such a, 
kind of placid charismatic species as well as got such a beautiful coloration as well so it's like really iconic from that respect so that's a great kind of segue into my next question um it seems that ecotourism around whale sharks people being able to go on vacation get into a boat go out and find whale sharks and swim with them is something that has been getting more and more popular at least anecdotally from my perspective um do you guys think that ecotourism has been good or bad for whale sharks. I know it's, you could kind of look at it two different ways. And for people that are looking to go on vacation and to, to go swimming and have that amazing experience, do you have any tips for people in terms of how to identify a responsible tour operator versus maybe one that is a little bit maybe more reckless? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's a really good question. And we, we've actually just been compiling some of the information for a textbook that we're working on now. And it looks like it's over a hundred million dollar industry around the world. Now us like whale shark tourism in, in, in general sense. So it's, it's pretty big and it's like, as Chris said, a lot of the work we do is in developing countries. And yeah, I think that's been a, a real positive for whale shark conservation overall. Like in a lot of the places we work, they're just, there isn't a lot of funding available. So having that kind of sustainable financing mechanism that that whale shark sometimes permit is, is really useful, but also it gives people a very direct incentive for protection. A lot of the time when you actually look at when whale sharks have been legally protected in different countries, uh, their kind of potential value to the tourism industry is like explicitly uh, one of the justifications sometimes. So uh, undeniably it's it's been, I think beneficial for them. Um, the key thing is, as you said, like ecotourism. Um, so it is done better in some places than others. And I mean, ecotourism kind of, it, there's gotta be a benefit to the animal as well in the, like local communities. So um, in terms of choosing a good operator, Chris, do you wanna jump in on that one? Yeah, I mean, if you chat to the operator in advance, you can find out if they have some sort of a code of conduct that they they might even have it on their website so this is usually a good sign if they discuss how they will interact with the sharks um, and also you yourself can um, have a bit of an influence particularly in some of the places where whale shark tourism might not be well established yet where you can you know say to the captain or to the boat operator that you are happy to to be respectful with the shark and, and even if it means you might miss out on another swim with it uh, if you if if the operator is happy to give a bit of space to the shark because um, often they feel a bit pressured by the tourists that have come from around the world to, to see the shark uh, and they want to do obviously their best to to give you guys the experience there's a lot of places where researchers work with tourism operators or work off their boats and includes um, us as well in, in various places and so that's usually a good sign as well if you have a researcher on the water with you uh, it's also useful because you can ask them all sorts of questions we get a fair amount of i think i suspect we have a fair amount of customers that that buy our whale shark printed gear when they're going on vacation and we get a lot of pictures sent back to us from the, when they're on vacation so i think that's a really important message um and we're going to share this with our community is you know just make sure when most we all love these animals but make sure that you're interacting with them in a responsible way you know don't touch them give them give them space respect their space and that's a that's a really i know it can get really exciting when you're in that moment but it's a really important um, thing to remember so my next question with uh so as you know we donate 10 percent of profits each year from our whale shark collection to you guys we're so excited to do that and i think it's great people are always ask you know what do they use the funding for could, so can you kind of give us some insight as to how you use our funding and uh, so people know like kind of where their dollars are going to. Well, one of the, one of the like huge benefits for us of getting the, the water lust funding has been the ability to fund these kind of exploratory projects we do uh, because we've set up new whale shark research and conservation projects in, in multiple countries and we've, we've helped um, others set them up in places like Madagascar as well as running um, uh, projects ourselves in places like Tanzania, for instance, and um, it's it's enabled us to be able to like go and start work in these places like the Galapagos, for instance, where we've been doing 
uh, some really exciting kind of work or participating in uh, doing things like using underwater ultrasounds, for instance, um, to look at the, the breeding of whale sharks and e even figured out things like now how to take uh, blood samples from the sharks that are swimming along completely unrestrained, not even sort of like knowing that it's happening. And the stuff we can do with that in terms of uh, like monitoring the shark's health is amazing. But the thing is when, when you're doing these, these projects that haven't been done before, like the kind of conventional funding mechanisms that can be available to scientists and that, they're just, they like, they like very proven results which is fair, uh, but but like, because we're also, we're often, like as Chris said, we're of, often working in these developing countries and it's like, there's, there really isn't the institutional funding. So having this ability to go in, like act quickly, if there's a conservation issue, uh, or to be able to kind of start off these, like these really pioneering projects uh, has just been huge for us. So yeah, so thanks very much. Uh, it's it's our pleasure, and it makes me really excited to hear that because that's that's honestly exactly kind of how we envisioned this funding to be used for, and we push all of our partners like use this in unconventional ways, like use this for things that maybe you wouldn't get funding for otherwise. Mm -hmm. So it's really exciting yeah. to, to hear that. Yeah. Um, so this goes into my my final question: is based on on both of your research. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of whale shark populations globally? And it's okay to be either one, um, but you have to explain why you feel that way, either case. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel optimistic. Whale sharks have gained a lot of attention over the last couple of decades, and we've learned a lot about them as well. Um, considering it's the largest fish in the world, there was really not much known, perhaps before the, the turn of the century. But we have made a lot of progress scientifically, but also in terms of outreach, people know about this fish and, uh, and some of the threats that they face. So uh, yeah, I, I feel with more knowledge and with more understanding and also more the involvement of everybody around the world uh, and, and you know, feeling for the sharks and, and having a, a bit of connection perhaps also to the underwater world that used to be out of reach for many people, uh, I feel that that's probably enough to push uh, conservation efforts forward and make sure that we don't lose those beautiful fish. Just to, to add to that as well, I've actually been uh, doing like an updated conservation assessment for whale sharks. Um, I was actually just working on that before. And what we're looking at now is uh, what's called the, the green status of, a, of the species. And that's its, its kind of current status, but also its recovery potential. And what we're seeing with whale sharks is there's no reason why they can't bounce back, like say close to what uh, say humpback whales have in terms of being a major conservation success story. And there's, I, I mean, their habitat is still available to them because they, they feed on kind of plankton, like that's probably not a limiting factor for them. And now that conservation efforts are really working and that like some of the fisheries for them have been shut down now. And like with tourism, we're getting hundreds of thousands of new ambassadors created for whale sharks every usual year. It, like it, it's gonna take a lot of work and they're certainly at a very low level now, uh, but I think they are bouncing back and I think we can, we can really help them along that path. I love positive, positive feelings. Um, I know in, at least in the marine science world that I, I'm, I do marine physics, but there's often, often a lot of doom and gloom surrounding uh, marine science. So it's very refreshing to hear positivity and hope. So for people that want to follow Marine Megafauna Foundation, if they want to learn more, what's the best way that they can um, follow you, you know, newsletters, social, what's the, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Yeah, just um, jump on. It's uh, marinemegafaunafoundation.org, uh, which is kind of the hub. And then uh, there's a there's an active kind of Facebook and Instagram and, and there's a there's a really good newsletter uh, which we're going to start doing a few more blogs for and things too. Um, so yeah, that's probably the easiest place to jump on. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, Dr. Chris Rohner, Dr. Simon Pierce. I, mean, I know you're incredibly busy and I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to chat with us. And uh, hopefully, I know um, Simon. I believe you're working on a book. Is that right? Yeah. And, and it would be really fun. Maybe we can circle yeah. back 
after. And uh, I'm sure people would love to learn about the book and learn where to get the book. Yeah, definitely. That'd be great. Awesome. Thanks, guys, so much. And thanks for all your support over the years. We really appreciate yeah. it. It's our yeah. pleasure.